absolutely hello collins how is everybody doing i hope we are excited for today anania said i'm doing very well hi biruk Monica said, oh, hey, I'm doing well. Hussein said, oh, yes, really fine. Thanks. Nasra said, mix between coffee and tea is the best way to start the morning. Yes, pure yourself some coffee or some tea. Absolutely. Carrot said, doing perfectly well. Absolutely. And Carrot, I really appreciate the move you are taking into helping your fellows to catch up with the EDA challenge. Absolutely, that, that's amazing, that's amazing. Actually, to everyone who's still having some issues with the EDA challenge, please reach, reach your fellow Carrot. He's going to be running uh, a short session just to take you through how he managed to get his. Really, we appreciate you. Hello, Yvonne. all right all right welcome everyone welcome everyone we are about to get started shortly All right, welcome Nathanael. Welcome Nathanael, the floor is yours. Uh, okay, uh, I hope you can hear me. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna give you an introduction on noise scale uh, using MongoDB. So I'll just start. Uh, okay. Okay, so uh, to start on MongoDB, like uh, we need to know where, how it, how it came, how uh, it reached here, and also what was the reason behind it. Uh, so. The main reason is the evolution of the data. So basically for time series data and for some analytics data, uh, it's it's somehow unstructured since SQL, is, SQL will only work for a structured uh, data. So it's, we really need a no SQL approach. So for example, uh, we need to have uh, the data stretched as much as we want so for example especially horizontally so mostly sql databases stretch vertically but we want sometimes we might want data to stretch horizontally which means like uh, some of the data might be dynamic and also some of the actual fields might be dynamic so in that case we really need to apply noi square approach so some of the characteristics i've mentioned as i've mentioned are support for unstructured and semi-structured data and also horizontal scalability and uh, it's an agile approach of for a data for a database and the basic reason for the need of mongodb is uh, somehow it's popular and also it's simple and scalable and you can actually deploy your own uh, database in a cluster which can hold uh, up to 512 megabytes which is a lot of data uh, so and also it's suited for dynamic and evolving data structures as i've mentioned before for real-time data 
structuring a real, a real time data is difficult. So storing that in a MongoDB cluster would be a feasible approach. Uh, so, and most of the use cases, as I've mentioned, are real time analytics and somehow applications with constantly changing data. And it's also suited for an agile development and for a quick, that requires a quick iteration. So it actually uses a document object model. So it's document or, or oriented, which means the model facilitates storing and retrieving data in JSON like BSON format. So we will actually see what BSON format looks like and also what makes it different from JSON. And it's also well suited for a complex and nested data structures, especially for dynamic nested data structures. So uh, I will come back to the installation guide and we will see that too. So for uh, BSON, uh, or known as also binary JSON, it's a binary encoded serialization of JSON-like documents. So uh, serialization means actually uh, somehow mapping uh, a JSON. So to JSON and from JSON. So it's a binary JSON means it's the binary encoded version of uh, normal JSON, which we are all familiar with. And it's more efficient in terms of uh, storage and traversal. So in any database, uh, DBMS, which is also database management system, storage and traversal are the most uh, crucial points to be addressed based on this, uh, to be addressed by the system. So BSAN addresses this traversal and storage uh, issues more efficiently. So it's an, uh, it's an encoded version of JSON. So it's uh, it's actually encoded using binary data. And also the data types have uh, additional types like date, binary, and object ID. So for a normal JSON, we, do, we actually don't have uh, like date and especially object IDs. So but the BSAN uh, returns that. And also it can actually when it's serialized, you can uh, it can be changed into a string, especially the object ID and also the dates. They can be changed to a regular JSON. So that's why we are, we said it's an encoded version of JSON. And also, uh, it has as I've mentioned, it has an efficiency in storage. And also, uh, JSON is commonly used for interaction between system and systems and APIs. So that's why it's basically. Uh, the, the leading format or notation, object notations for the web, JSON is, and but BSAN is optimized for MongoDB for storage and query processing. So we can't send actually the BSAN to the web. It has to be serialized to a JSON. And it's also facilitates a fast serialization and deserialization process due to its binary nature and also speeds up data transfer and retrieval in MongoDB. Uh, so, as I've mentioned, the BSAN is binary encoded and also it's more compact and more efficient, uh, but uh, JSON is somehow text-based and human readable. Uh, when we come to database, it's obvious like even if MongoDB is non-structured, uh, somehow we, ha we design a schema to make it uh, semi-structured. So we can make it a fully structured, but the approach would be the most efficient way would be to create uh, semi-structured data. So we are, like the main reason we create a schema and also the, the most crucial points we have to follow are how to store the data, how to provide the, a good creative performance and also a reasonable amount of hardware. So MongoDB schema design actually comes down to two points, uh, which we will see in the, in the next part. So you, we can either embed the data directly. So if you are fam uh, familiar with JSON, you, we can actually embed anything we want, as long as it's supported by JSON. For example, we can actually embed an array, and also we can embed an object, and we can nest it as much as we want. And also we can reference. Uh, so for the embedding part. So the main advantage of embedding are we can re receive all the information in a single query. So we, we don't have to use a lookup or join. And the limitations are when the document is large enough, 
there will be a, a size limitation since for a, I think for a single document, uh, MongoDB allows uh, 60 megabytes. So if we if our data is more than 60 megabytes, it will not be processed by MongoDB. So the one of the main limitations of embedding would be the size limitation. And while we are using referencing, we it's the most we can semi-structure it by based on our relation. And the the main thing you have to remember here would be uh, why you design a scheme. So it's really depend on the data accessed by an application. So for example, let's say we have the same data, but we are building two separate application. So we really need to actually define two different schemas depending on how we address our business logic problems and also how we actually fetch the data and represent the data in our application. So schema designing in MongoDB actually depends on the application needs rather than the data. So in referencing them, the one of the two advantages are we can split the data and so the single document would be much smaller and much is much simpler and infrequently accessed information will not be needed on every query. So if it's not needed, it won't be fetched. But in an embedding, even if it's the actual data is not required, it will be fetched. So which means our, our object would be somehow horizontally stressed. And the main general rules for MongoDB design are However, embedding unless there is a compelling reason not to. For example, if we actually need to structure the data for our application needs, we will structure it. But if, if not, we'll leave it by using embedding. And so then one of the most is avoiding joints and lookups. For example, like joints and lookups are the, are the ways to access data in referencing, but if we are doing, if, if you have uh, a main reason to do that, it's possible to do it too. So we can actually, as I've mentioned, we can semi-structure the data. And so in our conclusion, so MongoDB and NoSQL databases address some of the evolving needs in modern applications, as I've mentioned before, and also be, be some enhance the efficiency and performance of MongoDB. So like, let me demonstrate the installation process and some of the code snippets. Uh, try to let's start with the installation guide. So like, there are few ways to install MongoDB. Uh, so it depends on, on your system. So if you are a Windows, Windows user, you can actually check uh, the community edition on Windows, and also you can host it on Atlas. So Atlas is, uh, um, you, it's a platform when, where you host a MongoDB cluster. So as I've mentioned before, it will give you uh, a free cluster. So about the size of 512 megabytes. So you can install it there too. So let me demonstrate uh, code and we will and uh, if you have any questions like on the slide, you can mention it now. Anybody have any question? Uh, okay, let me show you. Uh, yeah, you can actually install and use MySQL and MongoDB at the same time. 
it doesn't affect any of it uh, unless they are using the same port yeah you can okay uh, so uh, i'll share this code snippet with you uh, it's just okay go on Hussein. yeah uh, uh, is it is it clear can you hear me yeah i can hear you Okay, so uh, th thank you, Nati, for the presentation. The presentation. Uh, uh, since uh, for this task we are doing it locally, is there anything we should like? Is there any additional uh, configuration or things to handle uh, once you have the local to use the the online cluster, the online MongoDB cluster? Thank you. Uh for the online MongoDB cluster? Okay, maybe let me demonstrate that one. Uh, Uh, okay. Okay. For the at last one, you just after you sign in or sign up, and does that you create a cluster, and uh, you just connect and. Uh, choose one of the, one of the these options. So for the compass, it basically means uh, you should have already installed MongoDB compass on your computer. So MongoDB compass is uh, a a GUI so to view all your clusters and also all your database. And also there is an extension for base code Mongo base MongoDB base code. You just click one of this and uh, you you connection string will be visible and I, I can show you mine since it's uh, a security issue so uh, yeah but you can just copy copy that and paste it either in, in MongoDB compass or in, 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 in any of the, the tools you are using so that's how you you do it in Atlas but in the local one I will demonstrate it So while you are using MongoDB, this is a con the connection string. So while you are using an atlas, it will be much uh, a different one. So this means uh, MongoDB is running on port uh, 27,017. And I'm selecting a database as at a database named 10 Academy. I just created that, created that, and I have some helper functions. So I'll just define that. Defined and for you. So, for the list, list collection names, it will just returns returns all the collections in the inside the database. So, 
So, and also the helper function will actually check if the collection exists or not. So if it, does, if it doesn't exist, it will just raise an exception. And so the way you insert the data is just, uh, you have, after you select the collection, as I've mentioned here, I've assigned a database called Ten Academy to self.db. And after that, I will just select the collection name and I will just create uh, insert one. So insert one basically means we are just inserting a one document, which means it will return only one inserted ID. So, and so what you have to remember here is it's an unstructured database, so it will accept anything that you insert and also it will store it as a record. So that's why we we, are, we say it's horizontally scalable, so since you, uh, you 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 can actually insert anything you want in, in your records. And for inserting many uh, or more than one collections, you just call insert many function on your collection. So as I've mentioned before, I have a database called Ten Academy, and uh, I can just select the collection name and insert many and it will return all the inserted ids object ids in mongodb case uh, it will return all the object ids i'll show you on the uh, after i explain all the functions and find all will return all the all the records under the collection and find will return some some collections matching certain condition and find by id will actually return of find one will actually return only one record matching the first match that actually uh, is acceptable by certain filter we uh, passed through a key value pair since it's a json like object it's a key value so some key having a certain value which means uh, so uh, with the schema i'll return to it but let me just demonstrate the first one so we, we will initialize our db class which is the first one this class and after that i'll just show you all the collections i have under the database so i only have users and ten academy and so let's just try to insert one insert into collection so i will just insert one which is i'll insert name john into uh, in in our database so it will return uh, the inserted ID and to insert more than one record, I will just create array of JSONs uh, or array of objects in JavaScript case, and I will just return that. I will just insert that. So insert many to collection. I want I want to insert to collection users, and I'm inserting collection data. I mean the the JSON data. So. As I've mentioned before, it will return object IDs, two object IDs since I inserted two of two objects. So I will show you by printing all the data I inserted. So uh, I run it previously, so I, I might have duplicate data. So I have John, and if we see like the 627, which ends with 6.7 on the object id i can see jane so jane is inserted and also tom is inserted above jane with object id ending with 626 so we can say it here i'm just using pprint to print uh, all the objects in that actually in that is in that json and i can uh, run find matching any records that are a name with with Jane. So now I have three three Janes. And as a, as you have seen here, like I can actually add. Let me show you. I can add here. H thirty three. If I you you can see how it's you can, it can scale horizontal so I, I can actually add any key value pairs and it will be accepted and also 
we can uh, so we really don't have any name uh, any record named rigs so it will just return nothing and find one will return the first match so we we will only have one being returned from here with the first object id so we can see here the first object id ends with f8 and from the result we can actually see the first match is f8 and now we we can move on to the schema part so i hope you understand why we need the schema in mongodb so as uh, in a, in an sql database the schema is basically since it's not horizontally scalable the schema is enforced by default we don't really need any uh, explicit schema validators for each uh, for each tables or for each entities we have so but for uh, for a no sql case we really need uh, validators and sch schema validators should be applied so for example i'm trying to create uh, an employee table and a company table so for our, our for an employee table we will uh, give it the required list so uh, i require name age and company for this actual table so i will define each each description and type so for example bison type for name is a string and description if any error is actually shown based on for example if name is missing or name is not a string this this description will be shown as an error so must be a string and is required so and also age is a number and must be a number and is required will be shown if any exception occurs and for company we have an object id so this is referencing for an embedding as i have shown you you, you just add like you don't need any referencing you just add the objects inside you don't need to actually enforce a schema here also for for referencing you need an object id which we you, we will use it for joining and also for looking up so for example for company we need an object id which means this 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 particular value should be an object id so which means uh, an object that represents some some mongodb record so must be an object id and is required and for our company we will have name country and city and properties are for name it's a string and for city it's also a string and for country it's also a string so it's just a simple uh, a simple table for company and we will just try to create a collection and if this collection exists I'm using PyMongo, so PyMongo will throw an error, uh, and we, we need to catch that error here. Uh, the error will be thrown if any any collection exists by the name employee, so it will not recreate it. It just throws an error, and we will now attach the validator for each table. So this this is how we attach the validator. So an employee for an employee we need uh, we actually attach an employee validator and for company we will attach a company validator so for a, every insert statement this this validation will be applied so every record should actually should be enforced or should enforce the, this rule so which means every record should have a name every record should have an age and every record should have a reference to a company object so the, and for gate validation, I just wanted to show you how the validation is recorded and check, check if collection exists. And these are the same as the above class. So I'll just show you the gate, the gate uh, validation part. So let's just run this class. And yeah, so we, we initialize our schema object and for that let me show you what the company's validation will look like so i'm just using pprint just to print it uh, in multiple lines so as a, as as you have seen earlier 
the properties are age, so age having a number and a description of must be an, a number and is required and company must be an object ID and its description is must be an object ID and re is required. And this just, uh, and also for an employee, let me show you, yeah. For an employee, it's just, uh, it's just we require a company. And let's create a company and yeah. So yeah. After that, it will return uh, to the card since we applied an insert menu. So we will we will need these object IDs later on to insert to an employee. So now we have on inserted records we have two records. So which is having uh, the first company as Mercedes Benz and the second company as Chevrolet and the. The four employees are Jane with age of 24, John with age of 26, Amy with 23, and Jack with 22. So each company, this company has been passed to be an object ID, as I've mentioned before. It not, it's not accepted if we actually pass the ID here. It has to be an object ID since this is a string. Uh, the validator will actually store an error. So now we can insert for employees, no, as you have seen, uh, as you can see here, four employees are inserted. Now we can actually show, I can show you all the selected, all the records in our employee table. So now we can see eight, and I just added the previous four before I started the tutorial. And one last thing I want to focus on is lookup. Look up. So lookup is basically, uh, the joint version of MongoDB. So now we can like we want to look up for from an employee. Yeah, so from an employee, we 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 look up for an ID. local field is ID. So underscore ID means object ID in MongoDB, and foreign field or the reference field we want to actually look for with company. So as employees, is just the table name returned and so this is the command db with schema with it's just a class instance and we have as you as you remember i have a self.db variable holding the actual database and dot company will actually go to that particular company collection and aggregate that lookup so if i run this you can see each for example, for this one, you can see this company is object ID. Now, it's not actually properly uh, serialized into a JSON. So we can actually serialize each company in each employee. So for example, for uh, for a Mercedes company, the first Mercedes company, I have four employees. I have, I mean, two employees. So Jane with 24 and Jack with 22, as you remember before, uh, when I inserted the the records, I used the Mercedes for two companies, for two employees, and also the Chevrolet one also goes the same. So this is how we actually target. So for example, from employee, we are just looking up the IDs, and so the, as you have seen, as you can see, the ID and foreign field would be filled where we actually foreign field on the company is employees. So we are attaching the employees here. So we get list of employees under that company. Yeah. So yeah, I hope it's clear. And once you get to try it and for one thing I want to focus on is how you address the current data set and in, in a MongoDB sense. So for example, uh, I think every one of you are, are familiar with message, this message data. So this is some particular message data that you have been shared. So for each uh, message data, let's say you are creating uh, a schema or a table called message. So 
as I've mentioned before, the way you create a schema depends on your application needs. So you have to really understand what your business logic is and also what you need to get all of this data. So for example, one approach would be to create a separate user profile object to handle the users separately and also to have uh, to, to access this user profiles as a reference. And after that, you can look through the data and also, for example, you can uh, treat blocks as another uh, another table and all, uh, insert all the elements inside that table and reference that. So this will help you to actually make it simpler and even if it will take some some time to create it after you create structure it or semi-structure your uh, your message in in such a type of way it will be easier to fetch it and also to actually understand the data more so while you create you are trying to create a, a schema for this message you you will understand the data more but if you actually store it as it is in a mongodb you'll just be looking at the same at the same data as you have as you are, as you have now so which is which is not the right approach. So I will just suggest you guys to create some some schema that will fit your need. Uh, it, it really depends on. So 10 of you might create some type of schema and the other five will create some type of schema and the rest will create so many different schemas. So just try to understand what is, what is required in your application and just try to gather the data that is just needed here. So as you can see, like most of the, like some of the data is, are not needed. For example, is locked, might not be needed. And for the attachments, you might need it or you might not need it. So if it's, if you need it, so you, you add that attachments in your schema. So try to understand your application needs first and just as I've, shown you in the previous uh, code snippet, you just create a uh, valid data and the required fields and you are good to go. And the valid data will handle the rest and it will throw an error if anything goes wrong. So you are, so your data, you, you can be sure while you are fetching the data and creating another part of your application, you are sure the data returned from your query will be somehow a structured one. So you, you you won't lose any data or you, you won't miss any part of the data since if it's there, it's enforced. Like the schema was enforced. Yeah. Uh, if you have any questions. Like... Or oh, which part was not visible, Hussein? Oh, it's the same data as you have, guys. So it's just the one message, uh, Jason. Can you elaborate more the letter? Like, what do you mean by what makes them different on the application side? What kind of application side? Like, okay, go on. Okay. Uh, I mean, that's uh, when we use uh, like uh, MySQL database uh, and uh, uh, MongoDB when we use on i mean that on the application side when we apply them uh, okay uh on the slide uh, i tried to mention what mo the most use cases that are applied for mongodb so for mongodb uh, real-time analytics is more efficient efficiently stored in a mongodb rather than in a mysql database so for a real-time data that has the Data will be so unstructured, trying to 
come up with uh, an efficient schema or AR diagram would be would take so, uh, a time. So we we it's feasible to and efficient to use MongoDB for such for such use cases. So it really depends on the use case. For example, for uh, an application that have uh, frequent and also unstructured data, it's easier to use MongoDB and for data that are structured it's easier to use and also efficient to use my skill it depends on the application need okay thank you yeah and the shuttle yeah you are right like we actually require we need to specify the object id while we are designing the db schema unless otherwise it will not be uh, you, you can't actually do a reverse lookup on that actually, on that key if it's not an object ID. Uh, as I have suggested, uh, Hussein, uh, you might we might need more than one schema for this project. So, and. Once you understand what your application is required, uh, what is requiring, you can create the schema from the data. For example, as I've mentioned before, you can separate the user profiles from each message. So while you are creating uh, the whole, the, uh, while we are creating the application that we are trying to do, you, you separate the users uh, from each message and you treat them, you, you treat them with the reference. So, which means in each message, you will have now only one, one user profile object ID. So, in each message, so which is more, more uh, clearer to understand, and more you will have a more simpler object, uh, a more simpler document. And also for the message part, or as I've mentioned, you can create a blocks. Uh, a schema, uh, a separate blocks schema, which will actually help you uh, while if you are doing some sentiment analysis in each blocks of the message, for example. And also, if you are trying to analyze each each blocks, for example, in each block, as you, if you if you see the data carefully, you can find uh, all the broadcast, all the links, and also in each link you can have an uh, a text and also you might have uh, just uh, a link which which is the url so like you can actually do further analysis in each block in each in each block it will be easier to create a separate table to do the analysis so the other data will not be fished so only the elements that you need will be fished so which is some of the semi structured one. And I will, I will share the notebook. Anybody have any other questions? Uh, okay, PyMongo is the Python package that will actually give you some wrapper classes. So you can actually call a function that, and PyMongo will handle all the inserting and also the reading from the MongoDB side. It's just like while you are using, for example, you are, if you are using PostgreSQL, there are packages and drivers that you that lets you connect to to Postgres, so it will let you connect to MongoDB. Okay, Nuri, go. 
Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. So my question is that uh, I already familiar with that of MySQL database and uh, I have installed all the dependencies and every software needed to use the MySQL database and also I'm good at it, but it's a new database that I have to learn. So is it a must to use MongoDB for our assignments, etc., or is it possible to use MySQL database as always? So let me answer this one. <clears throat> it's just MySQL is just one relational database that is suitable only for relational data, right? So how in a case of like Slack, for example, that's not stored as you see it in relational sense. And there are many types of databases because, you know, they, they serve different purposes. And on top of that, especially scalability is one key component. You no, know, just people are like, if you are analyzing, if you are at the level of Google type, you can't use just Postgres or MySQL, right? Or if data is streaming, that's another part that you basically just your MySQL becomes like too expensive to operate. It also doesn't scale. So in a way, like, the reason why different databases exist is because they serve different purposes. So in this case, for this type of message types, both like, you know, it's, it's the most suitable to use. You can force almost always things to be one technology, but that's basically means doing not the right thing. So yeah, it's, it's a must because we, especially in the sense of generative AI, people are not using at all um, MySQL or Postgres because it's a different type of operation. So for example, you know, nowadays, and you will be, um, if you go to the north, like to the actual weeks, like week one and after, then you have to learn basically vector databases. They are different databases. They are not anymore relational in that sense. They are more close to MongoDB, but they now operate their indexes are actually vectors instead of an actual, you know, um, hash because, vec you know, searching in vector is very different from. So just in short, definitely you have to, I mean, it's good that you are familiar with MySQL. There are many cases you will use MySQL still, Postgres and others relational databases, but this is another type that is suitable for a different uh, purpose. Does that, does that answer your question? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, to answer the last question, uh, I in, I'm using Linux, so I just installed it, following the, uh, the instructions. I think you can find it on, a, on the slide, so installation guide, on the installation guide. So you go to your preferred operating system and the operating system you are using, so, and you install it MongoDB following that instruction, and after that you just install PyMongo package and uh, you are good to go. So it's just PyMongo will act as a driver and it will let you connect to the MongoDB you just installed. And just remember to start the service and uh, well, for MongoDB, uh, if you are using uh, Linux, remember to start the service. You will find uh, uh, a brief guideline on how to install in the in the links I shared. So you just have to follow that. Uh, any other questions? Okay, right. go on, Binia. And then, why is it so spelled it wrong? Okay, can you hear me? 
Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Uh, thank you for the chance. And I want to ask on the document of the challenge, it says uh, we have to set up a feature, a feature store for the machine learning model that we're going to create. I'm not really sure how it works and how many databases are we actually supposed to use because it says you have to create a feature store on um, uh, on Postgres. So are we really going to use like three databases, different databases? From yeah, yeah let, let me answer also. So two databases, which one is the third one? Um, it says Postgres. And then MongoDB. Okay, it also says, okay, MySQL, okay. I mean, it's, I, if it says it's either a choice, but I think I specifically more to ask one relational yeah. database that to store features. So usually relational databases are quick and, you know, it's easier when you yeah. are setting um, table structures, you know, that are, that have good structures that after you created your, um, your features in the machine learning state. Of course, you can store that one as well in a noise square, right? It's it's not, it's just, this one yeah, is more, it's, it's a needed, so in principle, you know, you could have done, and yeah. there might be even an advantage in, in times where, you know, your, for example, if your features are more text-based or message-based, maybe that's yeah. easier, but for the sake of kind of giving you that introduction, that's why we just actually ask you these two so that you, you, you get to know the design principles as well. In one, a lot more of, you know, they, they are, um, it's a known. And so it's much more to give you more of the flavor, but as well as also what is normally done in, in industry. So you yeah, usually are called um, data marts. Data marts are like something that from your red, raw data, when you are trying to create for a specific purpose, you know, those are usually created in a very, you know, fast operating um, relational databases, while most of your other data is stored in a noise quail or even just in a file systems, right? So, yeah, does that answer, Biniam? Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. Thanks. Also, one off topic question, are we supposed to train our models from scratch or can we like use pre-trained models? Sure, you can use pre-trained models. I think the most important part is to operate models more than to create them more. You know, if you create them, great. If you okay. find you whatever is necessary, but just get the flavor of, you know, getting a model, fine tune and all anything, and then use it for your purpose. So yeah, you can use any fine tuned, uh, you can fine tune a model. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Uh... Go on. I think twice is it? Uh, it's a bit distorted today. I can't hear it. You can't just write it in the chat. Okay, okay. Alexander, go on. Okay, uh, thank you. I raised a question uh, before. Uh, Abdi clarify. I ask uh, both Radis and MongoDB are used for non relational databases. Uh, I have beginner experience in Radis, uh, but not that much on MongoDB. When asked uh, which is better and why, uh, what makes MongoDB more important than national uh, dams like Redis, uh, he answered uh, MongoDB uh, Redis for uh, in memory and MongoDB storage in hard disk, uh, which means if your data won't be lost whenever uh, the server restarts or whatever damages on the server. Uh, I'm not understand much. Uh, so what MongoDB uh, more likely better than uh, Redis and relational database? Okay, so 
to clarify what uh, what he answered. So, for example, uh, you, like you know what RAM is, right? So RAM, RAM is some some part of a memory or block of a memory that okay. is a fast access and mm -hmm. not permanent. So if the data is stored in a RAM, uh, if the application is terminated or your system is rebooted, you will lose you will lose the, 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 that data since the memory will actually clean be get cleaned up in in, in either of those set scenarios or the memory will be actually uh, allocated for another uh, program or for another uh, data since RAM is fast accessible and it's limited in size. So, for example, if you have uh, an eight gigs of RAM, it can be it only can hold about like five or somehow sometimes closer to six and the other will be allocated for the operating system so while you restart your system all those the extra the stored uh, data will be lost and rewritten so that's why he meant by it's stored in ram and the mongodb is stored in hard disk so hard disk has uh, a larger size with slower access which means your data is uh, is protected in any restart and also in any termination of any program so if you store your data in any hard disk you can access it later on but if it's a ram you can't access it if the system is rebooted and also the the, the program that actually allocates that memory uh, is closed or terminated so mongodb is better uh, somehow efficient in a way since it's uh, it's it saves the data persistently persistently means it can be saved uh, you, you can find it later on and if the system reboots and also the program terminates it doesn't really matter i think uh, it, it's much clearer now okay uh, thank you uh maybe uh, this is uh, good for uh, the speed of the processing but the only the storage and any other arms or any maybe the server uh, restarts whatever action on the server unfortunately is a good uh, choice is mongodb mm. but uh this is uh, more available for uh, speeding the process of the working i understand uh, thank you so much so ju just to add alexander on that i think your understanding is correct it's usually redis is used for caching right it's mm -hmm. basically because it's on memory that you want exactly it's because it's high speed you can use it for caching and that means like when you are developing something and if you want to cache when you are reading from a database database reading usually is expensive so what you do is that whatever you read from the database from relational or no sql then you cache it on on redis type or other type of cache memories and so this usually speeds up your your yeah your application so you're right your understanding is correct okay thank you so much thank you Uh, okay, na Nasrallah, you can go. Um, my question is actually more about uh, is to Yabo, if, um, and it's actually um, how do I say it? Uh, it's more of the data set is uh, quite large, and uh, I was wondering for time efficiency shall we take a subset of this data set that we have and try to understand it and find to it on <clears throat> and on a on a mla model then from there we could build uh, assumptions or try to identify what are some of the things or the overview of the project absolutely nasrallah it's like i think the most important part is yeah to be able to finish it and if if training because the you know the number of messages is large and training takes time i think yeah 
as long as you take some representative, let's say one channel and do it, especially during testing, I would advise exactly that. But of, yeah, so you are most welcome to do that. So, yeah, just to clarify, yeah. like, you have uh, over 12 weeks, so maybe we could study five weeks and try to analyze the five the first five week and maybe build assumption based on it uh, yeah. just to save the efficiency of the time or the deadline that yes yeah so yeah sure i think you know you are like i think mostly it's just to go through like the let's call it the prototype of building now in one you know in one day or in one week usually that's fine of course sometimes the results depends on the amount of data you give for the training, you know, the Absolutely. generalization, but that for now, that's not the most important part. The most important part is to do some prototype models to test them and to see some, you know, what is outcome. And after you also build on a smaller data, when you are confident, you don't have bugs in your model, you can basically run the model um, overnight. I mean, normally I think this should be, if you are, unless you're using some very complex model, it should be fast. But yeah, so you can use exactly. So feel yeah. free to do that. Sure, no problem. So 10x, as I understand, is it uh, today's task looks independent, decoupled from the previous two tasks? Yeah, yeah, sure. I think it's, you mean, exactly. So they are connected in some way, right, uh, Hussein? Like, even if they are, it's about loading data from, and in particular for tomorrow for the dashboard, it would be useful to build the one um, yeah, but yeah, exactly. So you can be doing both in parallel, like today's task as well as yesterday's task, whatever you want. So it's just, a, it is, that's why whatever time you have, comfortable you are, you can do them in parallel. And as you build tomorrow, they get, they get connected, right? So the, in particular, the most connected will be the relational database one that you will build today and the machine learning one yesterday and then the dashboard you'll build tomorrow, or you can do it today, of course, if you finish the others, but those ones would, would connect. So yeah, um, you can you can jump. There's no, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think you can. I think it's, in a way, we gave you the starter to build on top of it. So you can, you know, normally you can build it on that exactly parse Slack data, Python notebook, or you can have your, you can start your own new notebook. Normally just don't put everything in one notebook because it becomes big and you can't open it. So it's easier to split, for example, notebooks into different tasks. You know, when you're building um, models, maybe just one model in one, uh, um, in one Python notebook, but that's much more of a choice. You can do it, whichever is convenient for you, Abhi. Okay. Well, okay. Um, it's just some more clarifications also. Like, shall we go with uh, what about if we use uh, sheet files or S CSV files to store some of the information? Or we only allow to use uh, database for this? Oh, sorry, for this project. So, I mean, I, again, you know, it's a matter of we want to see your database. So in part for, for a quick part, CSV, great, you can do it, but we want to see also your database skills. So partly, I mean, it's not just, you know, when we build it, if you are in my team and you're building it, I, I think for one day, I will, you know, for a few days, I will allow you to test it on CSV, but as we kind of distribute our deployments, you know, that becomes uh, untrackable. So just for experimentation, you can do it on, on CSV, but of course we want, we want it in the database for, you know, to, to make it deployment ready. 
as long as you can do both, like you can demonstrate your database skills, it's fine. But again, you know, take it, why? Why not just run it from a database? It's just database small query should be fine as well because you can't query using uh, absolutely absolutely it's just that all of us here actually are kind of a bit poor in terms of time so we no no <laughs> sure yeah but again it's like, that's what i'm saying yeah try to do them as much as possible what is asked i think shortcuts are okay to deliver something on time instead of not doing it uh -huh. so for example if you can't uh, get there it's like definitely take shortcuts but it also means like for me i for us to you know we would be our requirements we're going to be evaluating based on what we gave you so in a way yes it's, it's, you know take it that if you don't have time better to do it in a shortcut than not doing it so. yeah okay okay We run out of time, I guess. Yeah. So anybody have any question? Okay. Any last questions? Okay, thank you guys.